Hi, my name is Dr. Riyas Kamar. Today I will tell you about thyroid fine needle aspiration. The description of the topic is under these headings Introduction, Indications, Anatomical Relations, Equipments, Patient's Position, Procedure and Performance, The Technique, After Procedure, Risk and Complications, Contraindications and Precautions results FNA pitfalls and the references. The thyroid fine needle aspiration is a test that samples a small amount of fluid or tissue from the thyroid gland with the help of a very thin needle. The diagnosis of thyroid nodules by needle biopsy was first described by Martin and Ellis in 1930 who used an 18 gauge needle aspiration technique. A Scandinavian investigators introduced small needle aspiration biopsy of thyroid in 1960s and this technique came into widespread use in North America in 1980s. Fine needle aspiration biopsy of thyroid nodules is minimally invasive and safe and is usually performed on an outpatient basis. Generally 20 to 30 minutes are required and can be performed in physician's office or in a hospital. Since the needle is so thin and fine that generally it doesn't require any anesthesia. Indications Depending on the nature of the thyroid nodule, FNA biopsy can function as a diagnostic test or a trial tool. Traditionally, the main indication for FNA biopsy of the thyroid has been the presence of a solitary nodule. However, recent literature tells that if a nodule in a multinodular goiter has grown steadily, become distinctly dominant or change in consistency then its risk of malignancy is the same as that for a solitary nodule. Furthermore, in autoimmune thyroid diseases such as grave disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis a dominant localized abnormality in the thyroid gland is an indication for FNA. FNA biopsy is also required for a diffuse rapidly growing thyroid enlargement to rule out anaplastic carcinoma or lymphoma especially in patients over 50 years of age. As a trial tool, the FNA biopsy can be used to distinguish thyroid nodules that might have a higher risk of malignancy and would thus require surgical excision from goitus nodule or thyroiditis which can be managed medically. The anatomical relations of thyroid gland. As you can see in this picture, the thyroid gland is in relation with trachea, the carotid arteries and the thyroid cartilage while the other picture shows the marking of the thyroid gland along with the anatomical relations that is not atop thyroid cartilage the thyroid cartilage the cricoid thyroid membrane the lobes of the thyroid gland and carotid arteries the equipments as you can see in this picture the equipments required are a syringe holder or a syringe pistol Disposable 10 ml plastic syringes, disposable 25 or 27 gauge needles which should be 1.5 inches long, glass lights with one end frosted on one side and should be 1 mm thin, alcohol prep saps, alcohol bottle for immediate wet fixation of smears, protective gloves, container for cystic fluid collection and lidocaine. One personal lidocaine should be available for those who prefer biopsy with local anesthesia. Patient's position. It is important to position the patient correctly. The patient is placed supine with the neck hyperextended to expose the thyroid. For support, a pillow is placed under the shoulders. The patient is advised not to swallow, talk, or move during the procedure. And thus, a clinical assistant should always be available to assist with the procedure. Procedure and performance. FNA should be performed after taking all precautions, explaining the procedure and answering all questions to the patient. Palpatory method. If the presence of thyroid nodule and indication for FNA is confirmed by diagnostic ultrasound and the nodule corresponds to what is palpated on physical examination, FNA can be performed directly without ultrasound guidance. The thyroid gland then should be palpated carefully and the nodule to be biopsied identified. 
In case of the ultrasound guidance, ultrasound guided FNA is essential for those nodules that are non-palpable or difficult to palpate, predominantly cystic, non-diagnostic after palpation guided FNA, small and located in close proximity to blood vessels. The technique. The physician performing the biopsy should be positioned at the patient's side, preferably on the contralateral to the lesion. The nodule to be aspirated is identified and the overlying skin is cleansed with alcohol. A 10 ml plastic syringe is tied to the syringe holder and held in the right hand by a right handed operator. Now in this picture you can see the attachment of the needle and the syringe pistol in ready position. Now two fingers of the free hand firmly grasp the nodule while the other hand holds a pistol syringe holder. The needle is then rapidly inserted into the nodule. Once the needle tip is in the nodule, gentle section is applied while the needle is moved in and out within the nodule vertically. This maneuver allows the dislodging of cellular material and easy suction into the needle. During this period of 5 to 10 seconds, suction is maintained and as soon as fluid or aspirate appears in the hub of the needle, the suction is released and the needle is withdrawn. When the appearance of fluid suggests that the nodule is cystic, suction is maintained and all the fluid aspirated. For cystic lesions, the fluid should be completely aspirated and FNA attempted on residual tissue. Next, the needle is detached from the syringe and 5 ml of air is drawn into the syringe. The needle is then reattached to the syringe and with the bevel facing down, one drop of aspirated material is forced onto each of the several glass slides. Smears are prepared by using a second glass slide in a manner similar to that of making blood smears. For jam sustaining, air dried smears are necessary and prepared slides are left unfixed and transported to the lab. The slides for wet fixation should be placed immediately in 95% alcohol for staining with the Papanka washer stain. Usually, 2-4 to four aspirations are made. Preferably, the aspirate should be obtained from the peripheral areas and different parts of the nodule in a sequential manner to ensure representative sampling. For larger nodules, the deep center of the mass should be avoided because it is more likely to contain degenerations and fluid, thus decreasing the chance of diagnostic specimen. After procedure, after the biopsy has been completed, firm pressure is maintained on the biopsy site to stop any bleeding. The site is then covered with a bandage. Occasionally, some patients have dizziness or pain. It is best to observe patients for a few minutes and if no problems are noted, they are allowed to leave. Patients can return to normal activity within an hour of the procedure, provided these activities are not sternous. Risk and Complications Complications are rare but may include bleeding, bruising and infection which generally produces some local pain, tenderness and a lump. The main risk is bleeding into and around the thyroid gland. If bleeding is severe, there may be pressure on the trachea and consequent breathing problem, but this problem is rare. Other rare complications include general swelling of the thyroid or neck area that is not painful and not related to the bleeding, hoarseness due to the temporary nerve injury, difficulty swelling, temporary abnormally increased thyroid function due to the stimulation of the release of thyroid hormone by the FNA. Contraindications and precautions. There are no absolute contraindication except profound coagulopathy and inability of the patient to cooperate. For example, altered conscious state, dementia, or communication difficulties of any kind, which increase the risk of bleeding into the thyroid bed. Thyroid FNA should be carried out as a targeted procedure on the lesion in the thyroid that has malignant potential. So, the lack of a focal abnormality is a relative contraindication to the procedure. For patients taking antiplatelets or anticoagulant medication, provided it is considered medically safe to temporarily stop the medication, cessation is advisable before FNA. The following parameters are recommended in order to minimize the risk of post-procedural hemorrhage. That is, INR should be 
less than 1.5 and platelet count should be more than 100,000. The results. The results of FNA are traditionally divided into benign, malignant with more than 95% cancer risk at surgery, inadequate or insufficient material or indeterminate. The addition of two more categories to this classification has recently been suggested. Suspicious for malignancy having 50 to 75 percent risk and follicular region of undetermined significance having 5 to 10 percent malignancy risk. It has also been suggested in the same guideline that the indeterminate category be changed to neoplasm either follicular or heart and cell where 15 to 20 percent malignancy risk is there. Between 15 to 30 percent of thyroid FNA results are inconclusive. Lesions that are more than 50 percent cystic on ultrasound or very small, that is less than 10 mm, are more likely to yield indeterminate results. Inconclusive results are also more likely with inexperienced operators. Patients with indeterminate results or inadequate material should be considered for repeat FNA. FNA pitfalls. The experience as well as the expertise of the cytopathologist is critical in avoiding pitfalls. Determining the adequacy of an aspirate, cellular atypia, application and interpretation of the immunostains and differentiation of lymphocytic thyroiditis from lymphoma are but a few of these problems. Larger nodules are more likely to yield fast negative results. To improve sampling, aspirate should be obtained from multiple sites of the nodule rather than repeatedly from a single spot. The absence of medical cells in an otherwise SLL specimen does not exclude malignancy. It is good practice to select nodules for biopsy in a multinodular gland by ultrasound evaluation. In patients with multiple nodules, FNA is best performed with ultrasound selecting nodules for FNA when ultrasound features are suspicious, remembering that usually no more than two nodules need FNA. At last, by presenting these references, I would like to thank all the researchers, the websites and all the personnel who helped me in preparing this video. Thank you very much.